Show of hands, how many of you are familiar with the names Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? Any of us? Okay, just a couple. A couple of us, okay. How about the names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? How many, how many of us? Okay. All right, so trick question. Are those the same people? Okay, so you guys know. It's the same people, the same three men. And what's interesting is we know them by their pagan names, not by their real names. Same three men. Why did they have to be given new names? It's a long story, but uh, we're going to start with this. It was a very sad uh, but important time in the history of the people of Israel. The year 586 BC, quick history lesson here, the Babylonian Empire takes hold of Jerusalem, destroys the temple, destroys the city, and basically the, the nation of Israel, as we had known it up to that time, their time had ended. King Nebuchadnezzar ransacked Jerusalem. The southern kingdom of Judah fell. And all of those Jews, those people of God, were forced into exile in a foreign land in the Babylonian Empire. This destruction was prophesied by Jeremiah for 23 years. For 23 years he preached to them to repent and repent and repent, and sometimes they did, but for the most part they didn't. And he said, if you don't repent of your false idol worship, if you don't repent from defiling the Sabbath and showing injustice, then the judgment of God will fall and all of you will be forced into exile. And that's exactly what happened. 23 years of warnings, and they did not heed the warnings. And their time came to an end. The judgment fell. And yet, even in this judgment, God had a redemptive purpose. Now, of course, we know that God also promised the Jews that after 70 years, that they would be able to eventually return to their homeland, which they did. Okay, that in, in that time that God would judge the Babylonians as well, and that there would be a restoration. And if you remember a few years ago, we studied the book of Nehemiah, and we learned about that restoration, that return from exile back to Jerusalem, and restoring Jerusalem, restoring the temple. But during that period of captivity, during those 70 years, a lot of important events took place. Really important things happened. God was still working in his people, even in the midst of their exile. And in particular, there were four young men that stood out, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and yes, a fourth man whom we all know as Daniel. They were a remnant in this time of great compromise and darkness, a real downtime in the uh, history of Israel. They were a remnant. They were a light during that time. And really, their story gives us such a powerful example of what it means to live with biblical conviction in the midst of the intense pressure of cultural indoctrination. Now given that it's Memorial Day weekend, we remember and honor our brave soldiers who throughout our history have sacrificed their very lives in order to secure and win for us the freedom that we all take for granted every day as citizens of this country and we rightfully honor them and celebrate Remember all that they did. That being said, it feels like our freedom these days is very fragile and becoming more and more fragile as each day goes on. We're inundated by messaging and media and advertising that really is trying to make us think a certain way, to speak a certain way, and to act a certain way, 
And if we veer from that way, then we're seen as insensitive, even hateful. It's unacceptable. We're living in interesting times, very unpopular times to live with biblical conviction. And so for me, as I looked at their story, really this is kind of like a prequel, if you will, to the story we all know about when it comes to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We all know about what happened with the fiery furnace. But do we know what happened before that? Here's the prequel, and what's really fascinating to me is all that happened to lead to that moment. Let's rise together. We're going to look at their example and see what Scripture says to us about living with biblical conviction in the midst of the pressures of indoctrination. I'm going to go ahead and read the passage for us from the NASB translation. Daniel chapter 1, we're going to start here, verse 3. Here's what God's Word says. Then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom was no defect, who were good-looking. Well, you don't have to be good-looking to be used by God, but sometimes it helps, right? Showing intelligence. You don't have to be smart to be used by God, but sometimes it helps. In every branch of wisdom endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, you had ability for serving in the king's court, and he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. We'll find out who they were in a moment. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank and appointed that they should be educated three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them, from the sons of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. And to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hannah, Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. We're saying, but Daniel made up his mind. He made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. Amen. Amen. Let's be seated together. This is fascinating, what we just read. King Nebuchadnezzar knew that with all of these exiles who are now part of his domain, that there would be some elite people amongst these foreigners. Some really smart people, really strong people, really able people, really wise people, skilled people that he could utilize to serve in his own court. Makes sense, right? That being said, he didn't just decide, oh, you're pretty good looking, you come in. No, he, he had this elaborate, organized system set up for them. An education system. Very interesting. They would, for three years, like a three-year degree program, basically, of them going in, and literally being indoctrinated into full acclamation as Babylonians. They were immersed in the literature, the law, agricultural studies, architectural studies, uh, philosophy, the Akkadian language that they spoke. They were all educated, immersed in this for three years. The language of the Chaldeans is what they learned. Now, Chaldeans were this people group who lived in the southern portion of Babylon. They were known as the most powerful, influential, educated, savvy people in all of Babylon. And it's no question then, why, why would he want to educate them in that kind of system? Because that was the best education they could receive. This was a very planned out 
a very intentional system that was set up. And not only were they immersed in the culture and the writings and literature, they also were forcefully changed, even in their identity. Their names had to be changed. Their names had to be changed. In the case of these four men, Daniel, whose Hebrew name means God is my judge, his name reflects God as his God, Yahweh as his God. He was given the name Belteshazzar, which means Bel protects his life. Bel was the chief, uh, chief pagan god of the Babylonians. He was renamed after the chief pagan god. Azariah, whose name carries the suffix for Yahweh, was given the name Abednego, which means servant of Nebo, again, a reference to a pagan god, and so on and so forth. Hananiah's name was changed to Shadrach, Mishael's name was changed to Misha. Now keep in mind, this is not like a Saul to Paul kind of name change. And to be clear, Saul never changed his name to Paul, just so we know, okay? Saul was his Hebrew name, Paul was his Greek name, and he went by Paul because who was Paul trying to reach? The Greeks, right? So th th just so we're clear about that, right? That's not what this was. This was a wholesale change. This was a wholesale indoctrination into a pagan culture. And it's striking to me that King Nebuchadnezzar, he was a very, very savvy man. He used the education system as his primary vessel of indoctrination. Now one cannot help but wonder how the enemy is at work beneath the surface in our own education system in America today. But that being said, we must note that these men, as far as we know from Scripture, they never complained about this. They never boycotted against this system. They simply went through it. They did what they needed to do, and they came out the other side with no compromise to their convictions. It's kind of like when I went to Fuller Seminary. All my conservative buddies were like, watch out, man. You know, they, they, they teach some weird stuff over there. You know, you're gonna be exposed to some weird things. Are you sure you wanna go there? I said, bro, I have no choice. It's the only one who's close. <laughs> They're not going to hire me if I don't have a seminary degree. i, I got to go somewhere. So I went, and I'm glad I did. I got exposed to a lot of things. But I came out just as convicted as I was when I came in. These guys went through this whole system. They did what they needed to do, and they came out the other side with no compromise to their convictions. You know, we have a lot of educators in our Living Water family. Many of you are in this very room educators, administrators, and of course, many students as well. And you are teaching, administering, and learning in a secular system. And there's no question the enemies at work in that system. I don't think any of us would deny that. But you're called to be a salt and light in that system. A salt and a light. God's put you there for a reason. You can remain strong in your biblical convictions even while you faithfully execute your duties as students, as educators, as administrators. Yes, there will be a time, there will be times when you will need to stand up for the truth. And when those times come, be strong and courageous. But keep letting your light shine. Let your voice be heard. Let the people around you see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Don't give up. Don't give up. There's a few key principles we can learn from the lives of these four men. I want to go through them fairly quickly here. The first that stands out is in the second half of Daniel chapter 1. You remember how Daniel and his friends refused to eat the choice food of the king. Now this is the very food the king himself, the very wine the king himself would consume. This was the finest cuisine in all of the empire. And the king offered it to these trainees. Why? Because it was the most nutritious, the best stuff out there. It would, it would 
help them to be strong mentally and physically, right? That was the, 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 the idea, right? Verses 12 and 13, Daniel declared to the official, please test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearances of the youths who are eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. It just, it just reminds me, um, you know, there's that thing called the Daniel fast. Have any of you done the Daniel fast before? Oh, okay. <laughs> One of us has. A couple of us have. Yeah. So I'm not a nutritionist, nor am I a physician, but I am a theologian, kind of. And um, I'm pretty sure that God didn't give us this to teach us something of nutritional value. Um, so don't feel like you, you have to do a Daniel fast. You can if you want, but you don't, you don't have to do that. Th this was not a health reason why they did this. It wasn't because they were vegetarians. They did this for a specific reason, and it was a very bold thing to do. Because what would have happened if Daniel and his friends looked shriveled after those 10 days because they only drank water and ate vegetables? Right? They would have been dead because it would have been a great offense to the king that they didn't eat the king's food. He's like, I gave it to you guys. Why did you not eat this? This was a bold move. And they did it. They ate vegetables. They just chomped on celery and whatever green stuff was in front of them and water. And they became stronger and healthier than those who actually ate all the choice food. This is not necessarily a promise. In this specific situation, I believe this was a supernatural work of the Spirit within them. They knew that this meat was sacrificed to pagan gods. And they knew that eating this meat would defile the dietary laws that God had given them as Jews. So their decision was rooted in a conviction to honor God's word, to honor God's law, to honor God's holiness. That's why they did it. You know, it reminds me of the very reality that this world offers us many good things. This world offers us many things that we have every right to obtain for ourselves and to consume. Things that our society would define as good. But things that we know would go against our biblical convictions, things we know that would dishonor the holiness of God. You know, freedom doesn't just mean the right to do something. Freedom also means the right to refrain. Those who are able to refrain are truly free. Reminds me of, of uh, random things keep coming to mind as I'm preaching this. Years ago, one of my coworkers, we shared an office. And our, our boss came in. He was known for having a very foul mouth. And he would always say choice words, and then in jest, he would say, Oh, excuse my French. And he, he turned to my coworker and said, Because he knew she was a very proper, very, just, she carried herself very well. He said, Jill, do you know French? <laughs> One day, Jill responded to him very respectfully, yes, I do know French, but I just choose not to use it. I was like, oh. <laughs> that was good. That was good. Oh, man. Freedom's not just the freedom to do things. It's the freedom to refrain. We look to our Savior, the one who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, one who laid down his life. And, and we're inspired to live lives of conviction and holiness, not just when people are watching us, but especially when no one's watching. To refrain for the sake of the glory of God. To choose not to indulge in something that we could very well do so and no one would care but we don't in our desire to honor the holiness of God. To live with conviction over compromise, not out of a legalistic mindset or 
out of a fear of punishment, but to live with conviction over compromise out of love for our Savior, out of our desire to honor Him. Secondly, we see in Daniel chapter 2 that the situation, you remember this, the situation with the dream, the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar, and how none of the philosophers, the soothsayers, the magicians or experts were able to interpret the king's dream. Now this is a really interesting thing. We don't have time to read the whole passage, but in Daniel chapter 2, so King Nebuchadnezzar can't sleep. He's being tormented by this dream. And so he's asking his experts to come and tell him what his dream was and interpret it for him. Okay, now this is a tall order. He's literally telling his experts, I want you to tell me what my dream is. Because you're experts, you're magicians, you should be able to do this. Or else why am I paying you, right? You should be able to do this. I want you to come and tell me telepathically, okay, what my dream was and then interpret it for me. And so they come in and they're all standing before the king. Oh, king! We are honored to interpret your dream for you. Just tell us what it was and we will interpret it for you. Right? And you know, King Nebuchadnezzar said, anyone can do that. Right? I can tell you, you can make something up. I want you to tell me what I dreamt. And here's what he did. He was an angry man. King Nebuchadnezzar was an angry man. Okay? He was so angry, he said, if you guys can't tell me what my dream was and interpret it for me, you will all die. And that includes all the the wise people, all the Chaldeans, the elites, and these trainees, including Daniel and his three friends. You will all die if none of you can do this. So, tell me, what was it? What does it mean? They were terrified because none of them could do it. And Daniel got wind of this. And so, he goes to the official and he goes to the king. He says, king, give me time. Give me time. I will do it. Man, that's, that's some courage. So the king says, go on ahead. He went straight, Daniel went straight to his three friends. And they prayed. They prayed hard. And they sought the Lord. And then, God gave it to them. God gave Daniel what the dream was, and he gave him the interpretation. Daniel went to the king, and he told him. Unbelievable, crazy story. He told him exactly what the dream was, and he interpreted it. This dream was about this great statue made of various elements, gold, bronze, silver, iron, and it turns out that each of those represented different kingdoms. But the head was made of gold, and the head was Nebuchadnezzar, and it was the Babylonian Empire. That was this uh, dream. So, King Nebuchadnezzar, awesome! You are amazing! And I am the one with gold on top of this statue. Great! This is what I wanted to hear. Right? So he spared everyone's life because of what Daniel was able to do, and he praised Daniel's God. That praise was very short-lived, but in that moment at least, he praised Daniel's God. Situation is the same today as it was back then. We're always trying to find solutions through the wisdom and ability of people. Just like they did, and they all came up short. The wisest, most educated, most gifted could not do what the king wanted because it was impossible with man. They themselves even admitted to the king, right? The nobles, the magicians, they all told the king, King, what you're asking us to do is really hard. Okay, we, no one can do that. Except for maybe the gods. No one can do that. Like they, they saw it for what it was. They couldn't do it. It wasn't just difficult, it was impossible. The only one who could was the true and living God. See, we live in a society that does not acknowledge God. We live in a society where God doesn't enter the equation of our education. There was a senator who recently was quoted as saying, God's will is of no interest to this Senate. Right? 
God's removed from our society. So who else can we turn to when we have major problems and challenges? We have to turn to people because we have no, no one else to turn to when all our trust is in people. We have to look to the goodwill of people, the ability of people, the ideas of people or governments to solve our problems. And consequently, it seems like our nation is like a boat trying, trying to stay afloat, but has so many holes in it. And with our wisdom, we can patch up one of the holes. With our government programs, we can patch up another hole. But the moment we patch up one hole, another hole forms. And it's constantly, water is just constantly gushing in. We can't patch them up enough. It, we just can't do it. It's impossible with man. It reminds me of the simple phrase, when we work, we work. When we pray, God works. Daniel and his friends, they didn't come up with some way of trying to figure out this dream. They knew that they couldn't do it. They went straight to the throne room of God and prayed hard. They sought the Lord. A person with much biblical conviction is a person of much prayer. We're all tempted to think that while prayer is good, what we really need is action. Right? That's what we normally think in our flesh. But remember this, God-sized problems cannot be solved by man-sized solutions. But that's what we keep on doing. Because we don't have a choice as a society. And that's where the church comes in. As a church, we're reminded that we can't. But God can. That we need to be a people of prayer more than ever. Yes, action is needed. But prayer is the fuel for our actions. And when we just act or react, then we're doing so on an empty tank. We need to be filled with God's power, God's wisdom, God's anointing, God's guidance. And we do so in prayer. I love what Daniel said to King Nebuchadnezzar when he approached him to declare and interpret his dream. Here's what he said. As for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. I just love that. We can't. But God can living as people of conviction in the midst of the pressures of indoctrination means being a people of prayer. Here's the last thing. As we noted earlier, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar's praise of Daniel's God was short-lived. Chapter 3 reveals the part of the story all of us know about. King Nebuchadnezzar's pride was as thick as it gets. So, he has this dream and he's inspired by the interpretation of his dream. Oh, if I am the head of this statue made of gold, why don't I just go all the way and make a full statue of gold in my own honor? And that's what he did. 90 feet high. So about, about the height of like a nine-story apartment building. Right? He made a statue of himself made of pure gold. And he decreed that when the music is on, when the signal comes, everyone needs to bow and worship that statue. And if you don't, guess what? You will die. That's the kind of man he was. He was so lusting after self-glory, it drove him crazy. And it came to his attention. It came to his attention. Ironically, by the very Chaldeans, the elites that Daniel saved by acting on all of their behalf to interpret the dream, remember that? Those very Chalde Chaldeans that he, he saved, they're the ones who ratted out his friends. Oh, king, there's three men who are not bowing to your statue. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're not bowing. Now, Daniel actually wasn't part of that equation which is an interesting part of the story, just a, an aside. Most biblical scholars believe Daniel was actually serving the king at a different place in the kingdom at that time. So he actually wasn't there 
physically wasn't there at that time. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were there, and they would not bow down to the statue. King Nebuchadnezzar, again, irate, angry, and he said, bring those men to me. I'm going to give you one more chance, one last chance. If you bow down, you will be spared. But they didn't. They did not. They refused to bow. And in his rage, King Nebuchadnezzar said, you're going to be thrown into the furnace, but not just thrown into the furnace. I want to make that furnace seven times hotter than it's ever been to teach you a lesson. They went there, and it was so hot that before they even entered the furnace, the soldiers that led them there burned immediately and died. But they didn't. Here's what they said to the king. And this is one of my favorite passages in all of the Old Testament. Quite honest. Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. Here's what they said. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Can we say all of this together? The next five words, six words? Can we say it all together? But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. This to me is faith. This is faith. This is not circumstantial belief. This, is, this goes beyond circumstances. It's a faith that believes that God is able to do more than all we ask or imagine. But it's also a faith that will believe even if he doesn't. It's a faith that's not rooted in what God does for me. It's easy to believe in him when he's doing things for you. But when he's not... Where is your faith? See, that's what faith really is. That's what faith really is. Not in believing what God will do, but in believing in who He is. Not believing in what He will do, but believing in what He can do. When your faith is rooted in the person of Jesus Christ, it's not shaken by circumstances because the person of Jesus Christ never changes. Now, in the end, we know what happened. They survived. They survived. Not only did they survive when they came out, they didn't even smell like smoke. They, it's as if they just, literally nothing happened to them. Not only that, we see a Jesus sighting in the Old Testament. The king looks in and says, weren't there only three men in there? Who is this fourth man? And he looks like a son of the gods. That's what he said. We see an Old Testament sighting of Jesus here. It gives me chills just <laughs> talking about it, right? It's unbelievable. It's an amazing miracle indeed. And we've all learned about the miracle from our Sunday school days. But what's fascinating to me, what's convicting to me, is what led them to that point. Why did they get thrown into the furnace? In the face of death, they refused to give glory to anyone else but God. Here's the point. Whenever there is cultural, societal indoctrination, the end goal is always the worship of man. Anytime you're being indoctrinated, whether you realize it or not, the end result of that will always point us away from God and point us to the glory of man. It will always do that. It always leads people to give their ultimate allegiance to something other than the glory of God. That's why, church, we need to be awake in this generation. 
we have to wake up. Because think about everything you see in here every single day. Where is the glory? Where is the glory going? It's not going to God. And as a church, we need to be a remnant just like these men were in this generation. To give our allegiance, our glory forever unto Jesus Christ alone. To trust in the power of God and not the ability of people or ourselves. To refuse the things of the world that we can rightfully obtain for the sake of His holiness. To live with conviction. To live with conviction that keeps us grounded in the midst of the reality of cultural indoctrination that only seeks in the end to take our eyes off of God and to glorify the theories, beliefs, and philosophies of man. He alone is worthy, church. He alone is worthy. He alone is worthy. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I just ask you to keep us grounded and rooted in the truth. That every day, Lord, as we live, we would just love Jesus. In all we do and all we refuse to do, decisions that we make, our words, our deeds, God, in every way, Jesus be exalted in and through our lives. May our allegiance be to you alone. May our allegiance be to you alone. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you for reminding us. We are yours, that we are your people. God, we live for you. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name. Let me rise and close with this song.